Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Putting on the Oxygen Mask, How to Take Care of Yourself So You Can Take Care of Your Child. My name is Vicki Spielman, and I am the Associate Director of Membership and Marketing at the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Our presenter is Dr. Rachel Bussman, Senior Director of the Anxiety Disorders Center. These webinars are presented by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, which is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, practice, and research. Please take advantage of the amazing resources on our website, www.adaa.org. You'll, find, you'll also find a great list of treatment providers on our website. Just click on Find a Therapist from the homepage, as well as free peer-to-peer -peer online support group. If you have any questions after watching this webinar, you can send an email to webinars at adaa.org. And you can support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website. Okay, let's get started. I'm really happy to introduce our presenter. Hi. Dr. Rachel Bussman is the Senior Director of the Anxiety Disorder Center and Director of the Selective Mutism Service at the Child Mind Institute. She leads a team of clinicians providing evaluation and innovative treatment to children with selective mutism. Dr. Bussman is president of the Selective Mutism Association the nation's largest network of professionals, families, and individuals with selective mutism. Dr. Bussman has extensive experience provided, providing cognitive behavioral therapy to children, teenagers, and young adults struggling with anxiety disorders, school difficulties, and behavioral problems. We'll now pass the presentation over to Dr. Bussman. Thank you so much. And I'm just gonna make sure that my screen is showing correctly. Yes. yes. Wonderful. So um, I'm really pleased to be here to present this webinar called Putting on the Oxygen Mask, How to Take Care of Yourself So You Can Take Care of Your Child. So thank you to ADAA for having me. So today's topic is about putting your oxygen mask on. And, you know, people have probably been very familiar with this schematic. You often see it on an airplane with this idea that before you can help someone like your child, you need to be able to take care of yourself first. And this other quote, which I really like, you can't pour from an empty cup, take care of yourself first. So we're really going to be talking a bit about taking care of yourself so you can take care of your family. And because I think it's very important to have real time strategies, we're gonna talk about several different tips. So hopefully when you leave this webinar, you'll have a thing to do. So just to, to provide some, some backdrop, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic and that, that changes sort of the landscape of life. Um, the COVID crisis is dominating our news and, and it really has caused really a restructuring in our society that um, I did a webinar not too long ago for ADAA and even four weeks ago, it was different than it is now. So it's ever changing and it causes us or makes us have to adapt and change um, in response, which is such a challenge. We see schools being closed and we see a transition to remote learning platforms, which make it very, very challenging for families in general. I'm just uh, doing the technology here. Caregivers are really forced to play multiple roles, which again, is one of the reasons why we can feel like our cup has runneth over, so to speak. And then just social distancing is sort of this term that's pervaded our life in terms of how do we do it for ourselves? How do we guide our children, family members, et cetera? So just again, to, to provide a little bit of a backdrop, the idea of, of what stress is refers to situations that can cause anxiety. I think we would all agree that this current um, pandemic is, is a stress and a stressful situation. It may cause anxiety. I think in general, we are finding that it does cause anxiety. Um, although it's, it's important to point out that the anxiety is still quite legitimate. And what we're gonna talk about is 
sort of how that relates to day to day life, even though the fears and some of the worries are very normal, given the circumstances, the stressors are real nonetheless. And then we also want to talk about stress in terms of resilience. So resilience refers to the ability to function day to day in the face of adversity. And so just as a reminder that we are all doing the best that we can, given sort of the circumstances and the variables that are that are happening. So this is a list that is certainly not exhaustive, that really refers to the fact that this whole pandemic and, and sort of health crisis leads to a range of emotions and reactions. And a lot of those emotions and reactions are really understandable given the situation. So this list could probably be, could apply to kids as well, but we're talking about parents, we're talking about caregivers. So some typical reactions could be feeling overwhelmed, feeling worry about uncertainty, feeling disconnected from work life, family, friends, um, some irritability, some a shorter temper than usual, and, and definitely sleep problems um, are not uncommon during this time. And this is not an exhaustive list. We could add um, changes in, in um, energy level or changes in appetite, but you know, for the sake of this, it's just to, to speak about the fact that some typical reactions and emotions are really reasonable. On the other side of the, the slide are some of these same difficulties, but sort of ratcheted up a notch. And so we want to talk today about how to take care of yourself so you can take care of your child. And so we want to be mindful of and noticing some of these typical reactions, but also kind of be on the lookout for things that persist, like really big emotional reactions that don't seem to go away, or rather than mild sleep problems, really chronic or persistent sleep difficulties. Losing your temper is not uncommon, especially when you're managing home and work, but significant emotional dysregulation or really big like kind of ups and downs and highs and lows, um, again, what we could put on the typical side of things would be um, being a little bit more vigilant or mindful about going outside versus really an inability to or just really not agreeing to go outside, even if your spouse or your partner or family members are saying, like, get some fresh air. So we see things like maybe a little bit of withdrawal or disconnection versus isolation. So we have things that are typical and things that we want to watch out for as more uh, cause for concern. So important to think about in terms of a caregiver yourself, maybe the person who's watching this webinar versus your children. Um, the thing is that a lot of the markers for when does worry become more problematic or when are we worried about stress those markers are really the same for kids and adults. So when worries or stressors persist, when the worry is bigger than the actual stress, like big reaction to a small problem or um, a more extreme or excessive response, and most importantly, when it interferes with other aspects of life. And so we're gonna loop back at the very end to what do you do if you feel like you need more help beyond these tips that we're gonna talk about. But the thing to keep in mind is some you know, inconsistent and kind of coming and going feelings of a little bit of irritability or a little bit of difficulty falling asleep during this time, not so surprising. A persistent change in mood, a persistent change in energy or sleep, or when it's making you really unable to parent or unable to um, sort of be part of your responsibilities as someone who works or as a parent, caregiver, that's when things are more problematic. So let's move into tips and strategies. So you're gonna see five tips and strategies. They're gonna go across the screen, screen kind of quickly and we're gonna go into each one. So we're gonna talk about validation, setting boundaries, finding your village, self-care, and modeling non-anxious coping. So we're gonna go into these in more depth, and I believe that these slides are gonna be available for those that want to, to see them again. So let's talk about validating. I really liked this, this list of ways to validate yourself. So I think it sounds a little hokey on one hand, like what does that mean to validate myself? But it's actually really important and important as a first step to sort of give validity to the experiences and emotions that you're having. So it means saying something to yourself like, I'm working hard, 
or it's normal to feel this way, or my feelings are valid, or I'm giving my best effort. So maybe all of these validation statements don't fit, but there are different ways of saying to yourself, this is okay. It's okay to not feel okay. Um, also, this time right now is not the time for perfection. And so COVID and perfection or social distancing and being perfect really don't exist together, right? And so it's, it's important before, um, sort of implementing some of these other tips to actually stop and validate yourself in saying, I am doing the best I can. And whatever that is, is enough today. And also noticing and recognizing that probably your children and your partner, spouse, other caregiver is doing the best they can. Now, doing the best you can doesn't mean that there's not room to grow. And it doesn't mean that yesterday and today and tomorrow are, aren't different. There are definitely fluctuations, but it's just acknowledging sort of this moment in time as being what it is. So for some folks that are maybe having a hard time believing that, it's actually helpful to just pick a validation statement and start saying it, right? Like, I'm doing the best I can, I'm trying hard, and saying it first can lead to sometimes feelings of actually believing it. So setting boundaries. I actually mean setting some literal boundaries and setting some more metaphorical boundaries. So what I mean is the reason why I have this stop sign is actually this printed stop sign or something similar to it. It could literally be a piece of paper with a yellow, a uh, red circle, yellow and green can actually help set a physical and literal boundary in your home when you need to separate work and um, non-work times. So for me, I don't have it anymore, but I used to have a sticky note that similarly was the essentially a stop sign that kind of said, you can enter this room, which is my porch, which is right now my office. Um, and it signaled to my son when he could kind of needed to stop, when he needed to check in and like say, is this a good time for me to talk to you? Or a green light would just be, anytime you need to come in, you can get something or access me. That can help set a boundary for yourself and for your children or other adults in your home to know when you are available and not available. What I mean in more of a metaphorical boundary is, um, is kind of setting a framework in your mind and in your home around sort of work and non-work, parenting and non-parenting, right? So right now, I think a lot of us are seeing a blurring of boundaries, which can actually be quite tricky, right? So for me personally, I find that I'm looking at my email and, and responding to emails and texts and communications from work almost on a near constant basis. And it's not necessarily because work has told me to do that. It's just, there isn't really much of a separation. And so creating some boundaries like a stop sign for your children, or even making a, a decision of, I'm not gonna take emails after X time and in the evening unless it's an emergency, can be some of those ways to set a boundary. You wanna set boundaries with yourself and with other adults in the home just around things that need to happen and things that you're responsible to do. So it might be that you and a partner are working in shifts where the morning is one caregiver and the evening is another or something along those lines. Um, again, you wanna set boundaries with your kids and some of this might involve a sign or a list because kids do really well with visual schedules and, and visual reminders for younger kids. Um, and Setting, so the really interesting thing about setting boundaries, and I think this speaks to this time right now, is this idea of setting a boundary and being flexible about it, which kind of sounds a little bit like a contradiction. Like, why are you setting a boundary if you're going to then break that boundary? But it has to do with intentionality. So setting a boundary and then having some degree of flexibility is actually going to be quite helpful. So as an example, um, I have some parameters for myself and what I need to get done during a day, but I can also be flexible and say, you know what, I, I did a lot of things today. I worked my hardest today. I didn't actually get to all the items on my list, but I don't need to get to all the items on my list. I can carry over some of those things for tomorrow. Or similarly with my son, if he has to do 30 minutes of reading, but he does 20 and he had a lot of other things that day, being flexible around, okay, like we did good enough today, let's carry that over to tomorrow. 
I also put this really interesting, and I love this in, this boundary around int intake of news. And so I think that is a boundary that can be both metaphorical and literal in terms of this line between being aware and living in the context of being in constant fear and anxiety. So you don't have to be constantly seeking information and in some senses setting a boundary around the information you take in is actually gonna be a very good boundary to set with yourself and news. I have done this with my family where my family sends me some news articles or some things they wanna share. And I actually sometimes will actively say, thanks for sending, but I'm all good. Don't send me any more articles. Or I have a boundary with myself where I just kind of delete those or archive them because I am accessing the news in a way that feels like a good boundary for me. And I don't need any additional information because it actually just raises anxiety. Now that doesn't mean putting your head in the sand and not being aware of what's happening, but it means being able to set a healthy boundary around taking in um, information. Find your village is something I've been talking about a lot. Um, I think that this is a very unusual time. We've never experienced something like this before. And so probably all of us have people in our village that were there before. They were there a year ago, they were there six months ago. Like for me, my, my sister and my mom and some of my closest friends um, and, and people in my home, my husband, my son. Um, but during this time, having a village that sort of extends past what your village was before is going to be really helpful and important. So it might be some community organizations like a church or synagogue, or it might be people in your village from your children's school that maybe you didn't have many conversations with before. But I think when we move to talking about seeking help and being available to take care of yourself and help identify when you might need more help so that you can then take care of your child. Having a sort of a rich and robust village is going to be really important. In fact, we know that one of the best predictors for resilience after a trauma or a stress is actually social support. And it doesn't mean physical social support. It means um, having people really in your village. So I really like to talk about self-care and I found this really great um, picture of the self-care wheel, which just speaks to the idea that self-care refers to a lot of different things. So it, recur it, it refers to physical self-care, emotional self-care, spiritual, personal. So there's lots of domains. Um, I write that it doesn't equal a spa day because I will admit personally that when I used to hear the term self-care, I kind of would in my mind say, oh yeah, 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 with self-care, that's, that's something that some people do, but not me, because I equated it to somehow a luxury. But when we talk about self-care, especially now during this time, we actually mean a variety of things related to self-care. One is that self-care is something you do during the day and it's an ongoing process it's not like a thing you do at night like take a bubble bath it could be take a bubble bath but it also and I'm, I'm pointing over here because i have noticed for myself that one of the things that helps me stay well is drinking water i'm terrible about drinking water it's usually in my mind is something i aspire to do but don't successfully reach that goal and so i actually have put and i'll show you just so that i'm showing you for sure i have a picture this is herbal iced tea and i actually find that it, i refill it much more frequently when it's sitting right here in my home office and the visual reminder of seeing the cup reminds me to take a sip and it's actually a very good example of so staying hydrated throughout the day you wouldn't want to wait till the end of the day to drink some water because you'd already be dehydrated so the idea that we want to have things we do throughout the day, some of those things could be stretching, could be doing this, right? Taking a lap around the apartment or the house or to the mailbox and back. Those are things we want to do. They don't seem very luxur luxurious and they probably don't even seem like self-care when you think about it, but they actually are. Additionally, other ways of self-care could be something you do at the end of the day. In our house, it's definitely, um, we're reading. My husband and I are each 
exercising. And sometimes that doesn't mean, you know, exercising vigorously. It could mean taking a walk in the fresh air. It could be um, just playing outside with our son. Sometimes it's something a little bit more luxurious, like watching a show together, but it's, it's a lot of different things. Asking for help is actually a component, I think, of self-care that's really, really important and not something that we want to gloss over. I do think that there's a perception or there could be a perception that this is a stressful time for everybody and everybody knows somebody who's having a stressful time. They have a family member who's been ill. They also are, let's say, working from home and managing the demands. And so it might feel like asking for help or saying I'm having a hard time doesn't somehow feel legitimate, but it really is one of the best things we can do to connect to our village and say, hey, yes, I need some help. So it's just important to highlight that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more, I think, in, in the next slide. So this is another few ideas just for self-care. And I really like this, um, the one on, the one with the different colors and the four boxes over four boxes, because again, it highlights there's lots of different ways to take care of yourself. And the truth is, is that your way of taking care of yourself might not be my cup of tea, but that's fine. There are lots of ways to take a break, right? Um, doing a craft is a way to take a break. Taking some deep breaths, right? There are lots of meditation apps or guided meditation apps, apps like Headspace and other of those similar sort of meditative mindfulness practices might not be your cup of tea, might be your cup of tea if you give it a try. And a lot of these apps are actually free right now. Maybe that's not your thing at all. And you want to do yoga or you want to run or you just you know, want to take a nap or you want to call a friend. Those are all very legitimate ways. And actually having a menu is going to be sort of the best, right? Um, and some, you know, I've actually been sitting in a hammock in my backyard a lot and just getting that fresh air is really, really energizing. Modeling non-anxious coping is also a very helpful tool. And one of the best things I think we can do to literally show our children what we're doing and is a great way to take care of yourself so you can take care of your child. So what it really means, it's a fancy way of really saying, um, kind of show with your behavior, not just your words, that you're doing as well as you can. So to me, this doesn't mean show that everything is fine. That would be very disingenuous, and I think children see right through that, right? What it means is focusing on what you can do, not what you can't do. It means focusing on now. It also means acting in a way that's showing that you're getting through something. So actually kids learn really well when we show them and not just that we show them an end product, but we show them the struggle, right? So I frequently will share with my son, not all the nitty gritty of my life, because that would be way too much information for his nine and a half year old brain. But if I've had a particularly tough day, I might take that opportunity to say, you know what, I'm really glad that I'm done with my day. Because I had a lot of meetings today, I had a lot of appointments, and it just felt like a lot of sitting and you know, frustration. But you know what I did? Like midway through the day, I looked at my list and I saw that I had five check marks and I had more check marks than not check marks. So I knew I was getting through it. So kids do well when they hear how we're coping. The other thing is that sometimes you have to fake it before you feel it, which can feel like you're lying. And I'm not suggesting that you do. But what I am suggesting is that sometimes we have to act as if before we actually feel it. So if we waited to just feel all better or not stressed or feeling joyful, we might be waiting a long time because right now isn't a stressless time and it's not, it's not a time just full of joyful moments all the time. So it means maybe saying, I, I don't feel 100% confident right now but I'm gonna act as confident as I can, and I'm gonna focus on what I can do, not what I can't, and I'm gonna hope that the feelings come along with it. And the biggest thing we can do during this time is something that most people would say, I don't really like what you're trying to sell me, but this idea of tolerating uncertainty. It, it refers to the idea and goes very much hand in hand with anxiety, is that we kind of have to tolerate uncertainty. 
Now, it doesn't mean, tolerate doesn't mean like it. It means that, for example, there are things I just don't know the answer to. So for me and my house, we don't know what's gonna be this summer in terms of camp or what is gonna be happening during the summer. And right now, I don't even know how to get that answer because there isn't an answer. So the best we can do is focus on what we can do and not what we can't. Um, we can get information when it becomes available, we can plan for right now, and we really can't do much more than that. So we have to be able to sit with uncomfortable feelings, which by definition is uncomfortable. So just bringing this back as we sort of wrap things up, what if I need more help? So maybe you've been sitting through this webinar thinking, yeah, I could probably identify a few things to do for self-care. Or you know what, I could probably turn the news off when I'm giving a meal to my children. Or maybe me and my partner can talk about how to reach out to our neighbors, or maybe we can have more video chats with a family member. That's great. Maybe you're someone who's saying, you know what, I, I really actually think I'm struggling more than that. My mood is really struggling. I maybe have had a history of depression or anxiety, or maybe I think I might be coming depressed or anxious. Asking for help may be the hardest step, and also knowing given the prevalence meaning how common and real depression and anxiety and other mental health conditions are, the likelihood is you probably know somebody right now who's struggling, which means that you're not struggling alone. So asking for help may be the hardest step, but knowing that one, telehealth options are there, meaning you could meet with a therapist or a clinician in your home, just like we're having a webinar with um, privacy and with the ability to get help. And it might mean that getting help, helping your child might mean getting help for yourself. And so I'll just leave with that idea that it's there should be no shame. And we really always want to decrease stigma around getting help and seeking help. And so the idea that that might be taking that step to call a mental health provider or your family practitioner or telling your spouse or partner, I think I need some help, might be the bravest and likely hardest step. I want to just review some resources. So I'm from the Child Mind Institute, and we have a lot of comprehensive resources at childmind.org forward slash coronavirus. We have tips for parents. We have articles about e-learning. We cover the range of topics related to parenting. Um, during this difficult time. We also are offering telehealth services for children, teens, and families for the, a wide range of disorders, including anxiety and depression, um, behavioral difficulties, learning challenges, and I definitely refer you back to adaa.org. There are tons of excellent resources on there, tips for how to connect with a telehealth provider, and just articles that definitely can decrease stigma and increase skillfulness. So thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate you taking the time to watch this webinar, and um, thanks so much. Have a good day.